Welcome to another episode of Ask Father, brought to you by the Fatima Center. I'm Father Albert, a traditional Dominican priest. The question posed to us today comes from Laura Anderson, who asks, does the new order of mass reflect a new religion? To answer this, we're going to have to go into detail about what the new mass actually is. In philosophy, when you want to know what something is, you have to examine its causes. We will start with the efficient cause of the new mass, which everyone agrees was a certain Vatican official called Monsignor Annibale Bonini. Now, this Monsignor had been around before uh, the council, and he had been sent away by Pope John XXIII because of his modernist tendencies, but he was called back during the council and after, and he managed to become the actual author of the Novus Ordo Mise. He was the real person who was responsible for it. Archbishop Lefebvre speaks of a meeting that uh, was held in the Vatican of bishops and uh, superiors of religious orders. He was the superior of the Holy Ghost Fathers, where Monsignor Benigni explained, exposed to these uh, bishops, the new mass that was going to come out. This was in 1967. And Archbishop Lefebvre explains just how surprised he was that this Monsignor Benigni was going to change everything in the Mass, come up with a brand new Mass. He went to Cardinal Cicognani, who was the one who was supposedly in charge of the liturgy in the church, and he asked him, well, are you going to let this Benigni change everything in the Mass? And the Cardinal told him that, well, if it was up to him, he would plead with the Pope not to allow these changes, but he said, the Pope doesn't listen to me, it's, he listens to Monsignor Benigni, and in fact, that's what happened, we can see. When the, the New Mass was actually published in 1969, in April, when it first came out, Cardinal Jaunet, who was a very respected theologian, went to the Pope and told him, well, how can you do that? How can you promulgate this new Mass? It's the definition given in the promulgation of this new Mass is heretical. And Paul VI told him that he had not even read it. He trusted in the expertise of Monsignor Benini, and uh, in fact, he had not read this uh, document that promulgated the new Mass. So, in fact, after the complaints by various cardinals, he did change the introduction to the new Mass, but he didn't change the Mass itself, the rite itself. So there is a problem with the efficient cause, because it seems like this Monsignor Benini was able to uh, basically get the Pope to do whatever he wanted. I mean, to the point where the Pope didn't even read over the introduction that he had composed to uh, present the new Mass. So there's a problem with the efficient cause. Secondly, the material cause, which is what a thing is made of. In the case of the Mass, it means the rite itself, the actual ceremonies present in the new Mass. So if we look at this, we can see that there's three fundamental truths which are denied in the new Mass. Firstly, that the Mass is a true and real sacrifice offered to God. Secondly, that the victim is Christ himself present under the species of bread and wine, that is the real presence of Christ, the victim. And thirdly, that the priest and they alone are the ministers of the sacrament of Mass. So, firstly, we'll look at the truth that the Mass is a true and real sacrifice offered to God. Well, this is attenuated by various things in the New Mass. First of all, the suppression of propitiatory prayers, because the fact that the Mass is a true and real sacrifice involves it being propitiatory, that is, that it renders God propitious to forgive our sins, that it satisfies for our sins, and so renders God propitious for our sins and obtains forgiveness of our sins. This is attenuated, first of all, by the suppression of propitiatory prayers, 
that were present. The suppression of gestures symbolizing the sacrifice, for example, the signs of the cross, are reduced drastically. I think there's two or three that are left instead of, uh, I think it were 33 originally in the, in the traditional mass. The stone altar and the altar stone with relics are suppressed. Now a stone, you offer sacrifice on stone. On a table, you eat a meal. So a table is made of wood and you eat a meal on a table, but an altar is made of stone. And so the fact of suppressing the stone or at least allowing uh, there not to be a stone in the altar, even at, at least an altar stone, attenuates the, the notion of sacrifice in the mass. It's if it's if there's no altar, well then no, there's no sacrifice. It's just a table. A table is for a meal. The altar cross was suppressed or put to the side. That is, yeah. norm, and traditionally there was a, a crucifix on the altar to represent the fact that what happened at Mass is that it was renewal of the sacrifice of our Lord and Calvary. Well, that was taken away in the new Mass. Also, the fact that it's a celebrated facing people. You offer sacrifice turned towards God, but if it's a meal, will you turn towards the people? Also, before, traditionally for centuries and centuries, the Church was in the form of a cross, which represents the fact, again, of the sacrifice. That, as you know, if you've seen Novus Order churches, they're all in the round because the whole point of the Mass is the meeting of the people, so they should all see each other like a big stadium. Final result of all of these changes is that people don't even know that the sacrifice, that the Mass is a sacrifice. I know I, I'm a convert and I went to Mass for 10 years every day without knowing that the Mass was a sacrifice. That's why I could never understand why people would go to Mass and not receive communion, because that's what I thought Mass was for. Because that's what the new Mass makes you think it's for. I found out that the Mass was a sacrifice by reading a book about it. An old book, obviously. So that, that already in itself shows that the new Mass it doesn't express the essence of the Catholic Mass, which is to be a sacrifice. Second point, the real presence is attenuated, first by the suppression of genuflections. There's only a couple left, which are often omitted. These happen at the consecration, but only after the elevation, which is significant because the Protestants can accept adoring the Eucharist after it's been elevated and shown to the people because they believe in some manner that by the faith of the people, Christ is really present. So once you've offered it up and shown it to the people, then you can adore it, but not before. Whereas in the Catholic Mass, as soon as the words of consecration, the priest genuflects, both for the consecration of the bread and of the wine, which expresses the fact that our Lord is really present, not by the faith of the people, but by the words of consecration. Now you can say, well, just because... He doesn't, the priest doesn't make an act of adoration before uh, the elevation doesn't mean that the, necessarily that uh, Christ is there only by the faith of the people. Well, perhaps, but it's not expressed as it was before. And the whole point of a liturgical rite is to express the faith. So if it doesn't express the faith, well, it's a bad rite. And that's what we have to conclude about the new Mass because of this. Point, it doesn't express the Catholic faith. It expresses the Protestant faith in this particular point. Another thing that you see in the New Mass with regard to this is that the gospel, the reading of the gospel, the reading of the word, is put in the parable with the sacrifice of the Mass after, or the meal. Now this again seems to be put in doubt the real presence because the presence of God in the, in the word there is a certain presence of God, I suppose, in the, in the Bible, in the Word of God, but it's not at all parallel to the presence of this real presence at Mass. And this is suggested that it is by the fact that in the New Mass, there we have this parallel between the two. And then, obviously, the most striking uh, example of this attenuation, if not denial, of the real presence is, is communion in the hand. If we really believe that our Lord is really present in each particle of the consecrated host, well, we're not going to take it in our hand. 
And that's why before it was only the priest who could touch the Blessed Sacrament or a deacon at them, perhaps. But no one else could touch with their hands the sacrament because it's really, our Lord is really present there. And if you touch the host, well, you're going to have some crumbs. That's why the priest, after he's distributed communion or the deacon as well, they cleanse their fingers because some of the crumbs will rest on their fingers and so they have to wash them so that um, the, the crumbs will no longer be there. Again, it's an expression of the Catholic faith and the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist, which is not expressed in the new Mass, and in fact seems to almost to be denied. Third point, the ministerial priesthood um, is attenuated, is not expressed in the new Mass. Uh, it is the fact that it is the consecrated priest who is the priest and not the faithful who are the priests at Mass. Now, there is a certain priesthood of the faithful, but it's a passive sort of priesthood that depends on the ministerial priesthood of the consecrated priest. Now, in the new Mass, these two different, entirely different priesthoods are confounded, for example, by the fact that the confidior, which used to be said alone by the priest and then by the faithful, is now said together, the priest and the faithful together. The fundamental idea of this, as Bonini expressed it, is that the assembly is the primary subject of the liturgy. The people attend too often like strangers and mute spectators. A lengthy education will be required to make it understood that the liturgy is an action of the entire people of God. While that's ambiguous to say the least, um, there's a certain sense in which the liturgy is an action of the entire people of God, but the faithful participate in this liturgy by uniting themselves to the action of the priest who acts in persona Christi, whereas, whereas they don't. And the person of the priest has to be there so that the head of the mystical body, Christ, act, and so that the people can unite themselves to this action of Christ who's present in the priest, in the person of the priest, in a way that he's not present in the faithful. So let's go on now to examine some of the central points of the Mass, particularly offertory and the consecration, which are the heart of the Mass. And here we see there are grave deficiencies in the new Mass, in this part, which is the most important part of the Mass. First of all, the offertory. The offertory prayers in the new Mass come from a Jewish blessing before meals. Blessed are you, Lord, if God of the universe, you who give us this bread through the earth and the work of human hands, we offer it to you, it will become the bread of life. Well, in the Catholic Mass, it's not bread that we offer to God. He has no need of bread. What we offer to God, even in the offertory, which is an anticipation of the what is offered during the actual Eucharistic sacrifice, during the consecration, we offer to him already in, by anticipation the body and blood of our Lord. So by offering this bread in the offertory in the new Mass, well, it completely, again, overshadows this notion of the sacrifice of our Lord, which is the essence of the Catholic Mass. Then in the consecration, again, this is very important, obviously. In the new Mass, the words of, our, of the consecration are recited as if it was a narrative, as if it was simply the priest talking about what Christ did at the Last Supper. And he took bread and blessed it and gave thanks and said, this is my body, this is my blood. and then the same for the wine. Whereas in the traditional Catholic Mass, it's very clear that when we get to this part of the canon of the Mass, it's no longer a narrative. It's no longer the priest simply saying what happened at the Last Supper. It's an action that's happening now. And in the rubrics, in the red rubrics, in the, in the Missal, it, it says specifically, it calls it the canon actionis, the canon of the action. And it's also expressed in the Roman canon, in particular, in the, just before the consecration of the precious blood, the priest says, and accepting this splendid chalice, this, chalice now. It's not just the chalice that Jesus took back then, but it's this chalice now that the priest is going to consecrate to renew 
the sacrifice that our Lord started the first time at, at the Last Supper uh, to be a, sacri- a sacramental representation and renewal of his sacrifice on the cross. Also, the fact that in the New Mass, the words quad provovis tradetur, which are offered for you after the words of consecration to bread, well, that's an addition that comes from Luther. Luther, because Luther added those words because they are the words that our Lord said at the Last Supper, as we see in the Gospel. That comes from the Gospel. That's what he said. But the fact of adding them, again, is linked with this idea that the Mass is simply a, a recital of what happened at the Last Supper. So it's where we just sort of read the Bible account of what happened at the Last Supper. So by adding these words, uh, the New Mass, again, approaches the Protestant form of Mass and the Protestant notion of what Mass is. And in fact, that this is what's happened over the 50 years now that we've had the New Mass, over 50 years, people have become Protestant without even knowing it. They, they think like Protestants when they talk about in their notion of what the Mass is, because of this New Mass, which is half Protestant, half Catholic. There's also the question of Latin being suppressed, which also fits in with the Protestant notion, because a Protestant cannot accept something um, unless he understands what it is, and he decides, well, yes, I believe that, or no, I don't believe that. And so he has to understand what's being said. Whereas a Catholic, it doesn't matter if the, if the right is in a language he doesn't understand, because it doesn't depend on him understanding what is said, for him to believe it. He, he believes it simply because the church tells him to believe it, um, not because he's looked at it and understood it and decided, yes, yes, I, I believe in that, that's true. Um, it's a completely different notion of faith. Um, so this change in Latin um, is very profound. It's not a, a sort of an external thing, although externally it's a very important thing as well, but it has a deep theological meaning. It has to do with what the act of faith of the, of the person at Mass is. We don't have to judge the truth of what is being presented to us in order to believe it. We believe it because the Church presents it to us. So, so much for the material cause. Now we go on to the formal cause, you know, which actually makes the Mass be what it is, and that's the promulgation. That is, the fact that the Pope promulgated this Mass makes it a Mass, makes it a Catholic Mass. It's a, and so the document by which he did this, why we, which he promulgated the Mass, was called the Institutio Generalis uh, that Paul VI published on April 3rd, 1969, which explains the meaning of the right, the formal cause, which, which gives it, comes from the definition of the thing. So it's this document which tells us what the new Mass is. Now, the definition of Mass given in this document in uh, number 7 says, the Lord's Supper or Mass is the assembly of the people of God met together with a priest presiding to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. It was this definition that made Cardinal Jonet tell Paul VI that this has to be changed because that is not a Catholic definition of the Mass. That's a Protestant definition of the Mass. The Catholic definition of the Mass is it's, it's the sacramental renewal of our Lord's uh, sacrifice on Calvary. It's not the Lord's Supper, an assembly to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. That's a purely Protestant definition of the Mass. It's very grave. Now, after the complaints of different cardinals, the Pope did change this definition, but by adding certain Catholic things, but he didn't change the actual rite itself. It's, it's, It's still the same. So it doesn't really change what the new Mass is just by adding a few Catholic words to this Protestant definition, which it originally um, was promulgated with. It's like as if you change the blueprints of the house, but you don't change the house itself. Um, You you change this document that comes before the right, but the right itself wasn't changed at all. So the original definition exp- actually explains what the new Mass is. And in fact, if you, as we've seen, when you look at what is actually there, it's a completely Protestant notion of what 
mass is. And so it's not no surprise that in the definition given in the promulgation, it was a Protestant definition of the mass is simply an assembly to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. And finally, the last cause is the final cause. It is the purpose of the new mass. And that is very clear. The purpose of the mass was to be ecumenist. Monsignor Bonini himself said it, that the, the, one of the things that they had to do in the new mass was to remove any shadow of a cause of stumbling for the Protestant brethren. And it certainly achieved that end. It, it did it very well. And it, of course, it's perfectly understandable because he's the one who made the new mass. And so that was his uh, purpose and he, he achieved it very well. But that's not the purpose of the Catholic Mass. It's not to confuse uh, the doctrine to the point where the Protestants can accept it. And the Protestants did accept it. Um, and they even participated in the formation, the creation of the new Mass. There were six Protestant ministers who were there. Some people have said, well, well they were just observers. But they themselves have, have stated afterwards very clearly that they, they were there not just to observe, but they were invited to participate. And you can tell that they did participate simply by as the looking at what the new Mass is. As we saw, there's all sorts of Protestant doctrines present in it everywhere. And denials, or at least overshadowing of Catholic doctrines by the rites that were decided to be used rather that would not offend Protestants. The disaster that happened after the Second Vatican Council, oh, one of the main causes was this new rite of mass, which changed the faith of the Catholic people. And an immediate result was that a lot of people simply stopped going to mass because, well, this is, they said this is not mass. So please send your questions then to the Fatima Center. And you can also consider to make a contribution to the, to the Fatima Center in order to help us to continue to transmit the full message of Fatima to the world. God bless you.